All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad to be back on the mic with you, and I'm going to spoil it right now. We're back with some of my favorite episodes, my favorite series of the podcast for longtime listeners. They already know what they're in for, but I'm going to hand it over to you now and sit back and enjoy as much of this as I can. All right. So you are correct. We're back with an episode in the Old Masters series, four Old Masters, in fact. These four people are co-authors of the book, The Principles of Advertising, first published in 1915. I ran across it while tracking down something else that I'd learned about from copywriting historian Sean Vosler, who has been on the show before. The authors of the book Principles of Advertising are Harry Tipper, Harry L. Hollingsworth, George Burton Hotchkiss, and Frank Ava Parsons. It's interesting to see how much the world has changed and how little has changed in the last 100 years. Of course, the world has changed and channels of communication are different, products are different, technology is different, but people are pretty much motivated by the same things they always have been. And what works in ads hasn't changed that much either. Now, you know what never seems to change? Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear in this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy in highly regulated industries like health and finance, business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, Nathan, the book we're going to look at today was published over 100 years ago. It was written as a textbook, and that should scare anyone off. But the good news is two of the four authors are ad professionals and two are professors of psychology. So that's in the book's favor. The language is a little old fashioned, but the information is practical and clearly comes out of real world experience. The book has 33 chapters. That's far more than we could cover in one podcast or even two. So I selected two big picture chapters and three chapters about copy. And we have some of the most important and usable points from each one. Now, if you're a copywriter, you might think that the big picture stuff isn't really necessary or relevant. And strictly speaking, it's not. But look at it this way. If you were a skydiver, sure, you'd want to know how to put on a chute, how to jump out of a plane how to open up your chute well before you hit the ground, and how to land. But it would also be a good idea to get a general understanding of how gravity works and that falling objects pick up speed at 32 feet per second every second, right? Same idea here. Besides, all this general context stuff will directly help you as a copywriter get more sales from your copy because it will give you a better idea of who your prospects are and the best ways to communicate with them. So let's get started. Uh, the first chapter from Principles of Advertising, we're going to pick the cherry pick the good stuff is from is chapter eight, the chief human needs and their satisfactions. The book goes all the way back to the days when men and women lived in caves and looks at how instinct developed. It says, out of the elementary instincts of fear and curiosity, developed vague tendencies of worship and reverence. With the growth of family and tribal relationships came instincts of loyalty, honor, obedience, and sympathy. Out of the instinct for health rose cleanliness. Thus, simple animal instincts gradually became overlaid with the results of training habit and custom, and the desires, needs, and cravings of each individual were infinitely multiplied, the book includes. Now, it's easy to fall into the trap of waving all this stuff off as evolutionary psychology, 1915 edition. 
but it's actually really useful for a copywriter or any other marketer because it points out, or if you already know this, it reaffirms that human desires are pretty primal in nature, no matter how so-called sophisticated you think your market is. It also reminds us that things don't change much among humans at the emotional or behavioral levels. There were jerks in the days when men and women lived in caves, and there are jerks today. There were kind people then, and there are kind people now. It's really tempting to get drunk on the idea that we are evolving as a species. Well, we're not like iPhones. Our operating systems don't change that fast or that much. The book says that all the pains we take as humans to set ourselves apart from other humans is just a version of what we've been doing since the beginning of time. These days we create our identities and our memberships in different tribes with, and I quote from the book, ideals of style, fashion, prestige, exclusiveness, propriety, etiquette, and all the vagaries of the leisure class and the dilettanti. It's pretty high level stuff, but it brings home an important point. You've got to understand human nature at a basic level if you want to write copy that reaches people. So the book goes on to list 24 instincts and matches each one up with a particular kind of behavior. We'll put the link for the book in the show notes if you're interested. The book's available free as a download PDF from Google Books because it's out of copyright now. Here are three of those 24 instincts, just to give you an idea. Curiosity, to examine novel objects for which ready-made protective responses are felt to exist. Explorative and investigative conduct. conduct. Constructiveness, to build, create, invent, and construct for the sheer pleasure of manipulation and success. Sympathy, to aid unfortunates especially those who suffer in the way that we have suffered. Before we jump into it, I just kind of want to emphasize what you started off the show with, which is a lot of this stuff is ingrained in us. It's the way we were a hundred years ago. It was the way we were a thousand years ago. It's the way we are today. And absent some sort of like human machine interface (laughs) where they're able to change the way we are. Uh, I think this is going to continue to be relevant hundreds of years into the future. Yeah, I, I think so too. So chapter 10, securing and holding attention. Now I heard what I'm about to tell you from an A-list copywriter recently as a matter of great urgency from him. But what I'm about to tell you is from a book that's a hundred years old. Quote, the first duty of an advertisement is to be seen, it says in the book. Unless it can get attention, its other qualities count for nothing. It was important then, and it's at least as important, and maybe more important to date. Here are some nuggets from Chapter 10, Securing and Holding Attention. Size of the advertisement. Now, this was written about space advertising, like in newspapers and magazines, But people buy small ads on Facebook and big ads called native advertising on news websites. So there's some carryover to this material. The book says the larger the space used, the greater the attention of the advertisement. That seems like it would be obvious. However, and this involves a complicated math formula, it's not a one-to-one increase. It's less than that. For example, Let's say you had an eighth of a page advertisement. Quadruple it up to half a page, four times, and you would expect to get four times the response. Not so, according to the book. You would only get double the response, even though you're paying four times as much for the ad. All of which means bigger is not always better. You always need to test to find out where your profit sweet spot is. Another point, white space. Quote, the attention value of an advertisement can be increased by surrounding it with a white margin. And the greater the amount of white margin, of course, the greater the attention value. But 
beyond a certain point, this method becomes wasteful. Generally speaking, a white margin that is one-tenth as wide as the space occupied by the copy is most favorable and economical. This matters today because you'll find a lot of designers on the web who like to use white space the way a drunken sailor is known to spend money, lavishly and without a whole lot of thought. Remember, you're not going for applause for your beautiful design. You're going for sales, and good copy gets you there. Okay, back to the book. One more point. Pictures and illustrations. The book says, Pictures and illustrations of all kinds, including maps, blueprints, diagrams, and charts, are effective devices for securing and holding attention. They are strongest when they show people engaged in doing something and when the action is relevant to the article advertised. This is important. The brain processes images faster than words. You can't sell with images or alone most of the time, but the combination of an attention-getting, relevant image and some really compelling copy is a great one-two punch for getting and keeping attention. Okay, this wraps up our key points from Chapter 10, Securing and Holding Attention. Um, I, I know you know a lot about design, layout, and graphic stuff, Nathan. Did any of this ring a bell? Yeah, so when I first got into copywriting, it was actually in radio. I was doing 30 second and 10 second spots for radio. Oh wow. And it was, it was similar. You were paying by the second rather than paying by the square inch or paying by the letter, but it was still, you have this much space and you've got to get your message across. And nowadays with how prevalent internet marketing is, we're not paying per inch. We're not paying per letter. We're not paying per second as much as we used to be. So a lot of times I think people think they can get away with not worrying about those old rules. But when it comes to efficiency, when it comes to editing your copy and making sure that if it doesn't need to be there, it's not there, it's still just as important because even though you don't pay per inch, you're still paying for attention. And if you are doing the, what you said, the drunken sailor lavishly using uh, white space and using copy that doesn't need to be there, you're going to end up sacrificing the attention of your reader or the attention of your viewer. So even though it's not as costly on the front end, it's still as costly on the back end when we're actually paying for it with the chance of losing someone's attention. Yeah, that's really good. It It transitions perfectly into the next chapter and what that's about chapter 14 the nature and purpose of advertising copy and the reason it does is because you are i think underneath what you're saying is what is the purpose of the ad why is it there what are you trying to do with it and that's what we're going to get into next so chapter 14 the nature and purpose of advertising copy okay from here on in, we get into what we came for, copy itself. I think the quick dip we took into the previous chapters was useful for setting up some ground rules and also as a brief reminder of some of the important things we already knew but seen through the lens of 1915. Now, I love this next point, especially the last word. The value of an advertising message is determined by its effect. It must be profitable from a dollars and cents standpoint. Its art is strictly utilitarian. That's an interesting word, utilitarian. The Oxford Language Dictionary, which provides the top search result on Google when you ask for a definition, describes utilitarian as designed to be useful or practical rather than attractive. That's interesting. Um, so copy and ads is supposed to be useful or practical? Well, duh, that's the whole point, isn't it? Your copy has to do a job, not get oohs and ahs. We're looking for results, not for applause. On this point, the book adds, that just so there can be no misunderstanding, 
advertising copy must always influence action, either directly by leading to an order or inquiry or indirectly by building goodwill. A key point to remember, you're trying to convince your prospect to do something, probably a good idea to decide what action you want them to take before you start writing your copy. The book takes it further by getting into the motivation of the copywriter. It says, the writer of advertising English must be less concerned with expression than impression. He cannot be satisfied to have his writing be merely technically correct or merely instructive or merely amusing. It must also get across. This, of course, gets right to the heart of so much content writing today that people try to pass off as copywriting, but it doesn't get across. How do you fix the problem? The book says that the writing, and I quote, must not only get his attention, but it must be so clear and interesting that he will read it, understand it, and in due time act upon it. The task of amusing or instructing a man is simple compared to the task of molding his conduct and directing his action. These latter purposes are the ultimate aims of advertising copy. A lot to take in there. First of all, it's old fashioned, both the language and the underlying assumption that all the people writing and reading advertising are men, even though more than 50% of the people in the world are female. Just wanted to acknowledge that. What's just as important and maybe more important for an advertiser and a copywriter is that copy is harder to write because it's easier to amuse people than to persuade them to take action. We'll talk about a couple major ways to persuade them to take action in just a little bit. One more thing first, though. The book talks about economy in the sense of using as few words as possible to get the job done. Not like short copy necessarily, but like writing in a very lean, muscular way. The book says, to be most efficient, copy should economize the reader's attention and should impress him forcibly. Translation, no flabby or wimpy copy. Make it tight and strong. If this is hard for you, one solution is to plan an extra editing session where all you do is take out as many words as possible, shorten sentences, and look for ways to use smaller words. That's certainly a good start. Finally, the book says, every word in the copy should be a necessary part of the message. It should also be a word that is familiar to the reader and does not by its strangeness lead him to pause in his progress. So Nathan, what do you think about all that? It reminds me of one of the things that you first taught me when we started working together, which was copy should be like a greased slide. Anytime that there's a confusing word, anytime that there's a confusing concept, anytime that there's something that might lead the reader to say, I'm going to go look that up on Google real quick. That's like a speed bump that has the ability to knock somebody off of the slide. And we want to make sure that we have a smooth greased slide from top to bottom so they never have the opportunity to bump off of the sales copy and they just go right through it the way that we want them that's great yep that's that's exactly right and that's um that's great because it comes from you <laughs> well it's a great rendition of you doing me uh, okay or number four is chapter 16 which is reason why copy uh, this book came out in 2015 and then again in 2020. So one way or another, within 10 or 15 years of when Johnny Kennedy introduced the term reason why copy or reason why advertising. And he introduced that idea to the world maybe around 1910, 1906, 1910. This chapter makes a sharp distinction between reason why copy and what authors call human interest copy. Reason why copy, of course, is factual and logical. They point out human interest copy is more emotional and sensory, they say. So here's a point from the book you can take to the bank. 
reason why copy has a larger field of usefulness than human interest. Competitive conditions are such that it is often not enough for the advertiser to create a desire for his type of product. The response he needs is a deliberate choice of his particular product. Think about that. It's so true today. A phrase that comes up is tech specs. Even if you are not a technical person at all, with reason why copy, it may all boil down to tech specs. Listen, the distinction between two closely similar articles is often one that can be perceived by the mind only. The pleasure of riding in an automobile is much the same, but no two makes of car are precisely alike. The price, appearance, power, cost of upkeep, and many other considerations lead to a man's choice of one particular make among many in the market. From this point of view, price, appearance, and power are all technical specifications or tech specs. Quite different than, and I'm just suggesting this is a tagline here, Ride in our new Marmot SUV, and it feels like your butt is floating on a mattress of soap bubbles. That's pretty emotional and sensory, and these days it's probably not enough. The book says, all reason why copy should be based upon evidence, either stated and implied, preferably stated, and evidence is of three main types, tests and guarantees, testimony, facts and figures. All of this is relatively well known these days. At the time the book was written, some of these ideas may have been relatively new to copywriters. The book talks about two approaches in structuring reason why copy. An inductive appeal, which starts with one concrete fact or bit of evidence, and from this reasons to a general assertion or conclusion. And the second approach is called deductive reasoning, And it's more difficult than the inductive approach because it involves a carefully constructed chain of logic or deductive argument. So you kind of start with the conclusion and then you systematically go about proving it. It's very important, the book says, to start with a strong claim that will appeal to the target market and to carefully construct the argument to back it up. While deductive reasoning may be the hardest type of copy to write, it can be the most profitable because it is self-contained. Once you read a good argument, you're done. You know, you may need to be reassured or um, objections overcome, but basically that can make the sale by itself. So the whole carefully constructed argument will go further to convince skeptical and unfamiliar prospects than any other kind of copy. So does that give you some new insights or or perspectives about reason why copy, Nathan? Uh, It makes me think about one of the clients that I have right now. We sell to retailers and we also sell to individuals. And when it comes to selling to the retailers, doing the B2B side of the copy is always a lot more reason why focused and selling to the customers is a little bit more personal interest focused. Um, so I think that depending on who your market is, the, the clearest the differentiator that I can think of is are they B2B or are they B2C uh, pieces of copy? But even inside of both of them, um, knowing who you're writing to and knowing which one is going to be more persuasive to them is important. And um, I, I always try to use a little mix of both, but definitely on who I'm writing to determines whether I lean more to one side or more to the other. Yeah. So for a B2B, you might have like 80% reason why and 20% human interest for, um, consumer, you might have 80% human interest and 20% reason why that makes sense. And yeah, that's, that's true to my experience as well. All right, so let's talk about that other kind of copy, human interest copy from chapter 17. The book says human interest or short circuit copy makes its chief appeal to the sense or the emotions of the reader. Response to it is instinctive rather than reasoned and consequently depends largely upon 
suggestion, very little on deliberation. This is vitally important. Maybe as copywriters, we think we know how people will respond to a word, a phrase, or an image, but that smug confidence can backfire. The authors point out an ad campaign for men's suits that failed because of an association the marketers didn't realize until it was too late. The headline for tailored clothing made the point that the clothing should be individual for each person, since everybody's unique. The headline was, Down to Your Thumbprint. What they didn't think about was that when someone is arrested and booked at a police station, they get their thumbprint taken along with the rest of their prints. A lot of the public thought that, though, and avoided tailored suits like they were the orange jumpsuits of 2021. Because, you know, it wasn't cool to be a gangsta in 1915. And that's the biggest part of the problem with human interest copy. As the book says, the writer must constantly be on guard against elements in display or copy that will distract the reader from the idea to be conveyed or associate some unpleasant idea with it. One more thing about truly sensual copy. The simplest, though by no means the easiest, of human interest appeals is the direct appeal to the senses. This almost always involves the use of illustration, the book says. It is difficult by means of words alone to suggest to the reader the taste or sound or smell of the article, and of course, making him imagine the appearance, the illustration is 100 times more effective than words. However, the authors don't rule out using words altogether when you're using the human interest approach. What they say is, if you do, you need to be very precise about it. Here's some advice on that from the book. Vague general words, such as pleasant, delightful, delicious, and the like, have no human interest value. The writer should try to pick out the distinguishing superiority of this article that will appeal to the senses and suggest this by an exact and concrete description. And they give this example. Headline. Wouldn't you like a soap with the real fragrance of violets? Copy. Two paragraphs of the copy. The delicate perfume of the fresh, sweet violets. So real, you can close your eyes and fairly believe you are smelling the fresh-cut flowers themselves. This is the toilet delight of Jurgen's violet glycerin soap. And we have caught this real violet fragrance in soap so clear you can see through it, the color of the violet leaf, a beautiful translucent green. Not bad for a soap ad, huh? Well, that wraps up what we have time for today. Uh, before I recap, any thoughts? Uh, that last one, I think, is one of the most difficult ones because... It's really easy when you're when you're going through that in your editing process, it's really easy to psych yourself out or to especially when it comes to like associations people might make uh, that they might draw, um, you might get hung up on it. So I guess I wanted to ask if you had any tips on whether when you're going through that process and examining your copy for things like that, are there ways that you keep yourself from overthinking stuff? So good question. I mean, I I think the way to keep from overthinking is to engage with other people. Sometimes if you can just monitor your own speech as you're talking to a friend about it, and this might be a place where, um, I mean, I think of what Frank Luntz does on TV with political stuff with dial groups if you could do it this is way more complicated than most people are going to do but if you could have a way uh, where people are actually telling you their responses moment to moment i mean one of the problems with focus groups the way most people do them is i'm not sure how accurate the information is but sometimes you just write it out and, and tell it to somebody and say how they make you feel yeah one of the I don't want to say disadvantages, but one of the hurdles that we have to overcome as copywriters is that we don't have the prospect right there in front of us. We can't see the subtle facial 
movements that they might, uh, the expressions when we say a certain phrase, if we're talking to someone or we're trying to sell in person, we can see how a phrase affects the person. We can see the, the facial um, movements that they make. We can see the, the reactions to things and we don't have that with copy. So it's one of those, it's one of those things where as a copywriter, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's a disadvantage, but it's definitely a hurdle that we have to overcome that other salespeople might not have such difficulty with and just one thing to be conscious of. Yeah. And the other thing is just be aware of when you're using very emotional or sensual words and you may want to A-B split test. That's easier to do on the internet than it used to be in the old days of print. So it's one of those very high roller things. It's, it's very high risk on the upside, but it can be very high risk on the downside too. David, I always love these episodes because they always get to the underlying stuff with so many bright, shiny objects out there with copywriting these days. These episodes get down to the meat and potatoes of copywriting. That's why I think I love these episodes so much. So thank you for putting this one together. What was the name of this book again? If people want to go check it out, I know we'll have it in the show notes, but for just the listeners only. Sure. Um, it's called The Principles of Advertising. You can go on to Google Books and uh, find it there. Um, it it's it doesn't just come up when you you type it up. I'm not sure you can find it in print, but you know, go that's, to our show notes and see the link. That's a great that's a great way to promote. Head on over to copywriterspodcast.com, find the episode there, and then click through on the show notes. Much easier way. And while you're there, make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast as well. And until next time, David. Thank you very much, man, and we'll catch you later. Catch you later.